Dr. Fred, I think, did a, a fabulous job of laying out the overall global political and economic uh, landscape for climate change. What we now want to do is have a panel where the two panelists focus on the two words in the title of our conference, Crowds and Climate. So we have uh, Kareem Lakani, who is one of the leading researchers on the technologies and the social and business and organizational practices that allow us to harness crowds and their collective intelligence. And we have Sergei Manofsky, who has been right on the front lines of dealing with the hard issues of climate in the biggest city in this country, New York City. So uh, just to give you a little more introduction of each, uh, Kareem Lakani is the Lumry Family Associate Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. He's also there the principal investigator of the Harvard NASA Tournament Lab at Harvard's Institute for Quantitative Social Science. He specializes in distributed innovation systems, including things like open source software communities and innovation contests. His work has been published in Harvard Business Review, Management Science, Organization Science, and a number of other, number of other publications. His research has also been featured in leading publications like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, Economist, Science Magazine. Uh, I've known Kareem since he was a doctoral student here. He got his PhD in uh, management here at MIT, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us again today, Kareem. Uh, Sergey is the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability, where he manages citywide energy policy and the city's comprehensive sustainability initiative. In that capacity, he leads a team of engineers, economists, policy analysts, architects, and attorneys that conduct innovative research and manage key programs on energy and climate. Among the things his team has done has been prize-winning work on a program for phasing out heavy fuel oil through innovative financing and regulatory models, and a comprehensive evaluation of the reliability of New York City's electric, gas, steam, and refined product supply in the aftermath of Superstorm Standy. Both of our panelists, it turns out, have undergraduate degrees in engineering. Sergey also has one in history, and both have PhDs in things related to management. Sergey's PhD is in policy analysis from the Rand Graduate School. So we're very happy to have both of you with us today. Thank you. And I believe the way we're going to do this is each will talk for about 10 or 12 minutes. I think Kareem will go first and then Sergey, and then we'll have discussion between the two of them and with the audience. Kareem. Great. If we could have the slide deck up, that'd be great. So thanks, Tom, for uh, the invitation uh, and the opportunity to engage. Um, it's uh, quite the uh, challenge in front of us in terms of the environment. And what I'm going to talk to you about is how we're trying to both create proofs of concepts, but actually routinize uh, the use of crowds in a bunch of different institutions so that it's not a Herculean effort, that all of us can, in fact, running organizations of all types can, in fact, use crowds to solve the problems that, that we have in front of us. Um, so before I give you what I've been working on, I just want to sort of take you back um, in time to uh, the toughest science and uh, technology problem uh, facing nations about 300 years ago. Um, and this was the longitude problem that many countries faced. Uh, the British fleet actually sank off the, just the south coast of, of, of the UK in 1707 due to bad navigation. They didn't know where they were. They knew there were rocks around, but they didn't know exactly where they were, and the entire fleet sank. They lost 3,000 people. Um, the, Government came up with the idea of the prize. They said, you know, basically, we're going to offer 20,000 pounds, lots of money in, in those days, um, and uh, pushed for solutions from any, anywhere, anybody that can actually create a working, working apparatus to find the longitude at sea. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, you know, inventor of gravity and calculus, you know, basically said there's only one way to solve this problem, and it's through methods of astronomy. There's no other way to solve this problem. You know, he's a certified genius even now. Um, and uh, we live in a shadow in many ways, but he was pretty much convinced that the only way to solve this problem was through astronomy. Um, the British government listened to him, had him on the board, but they invited uh, lots of uh, submissions. 
Some were pretty ridiculous. So somebody said, you know, we need to find telepathic dogs that will bray, you know, when they're at the longitude. Uh, another great solution was, you know, we should just put cannons 100 miles apart all over the sea lanes, and at noon they'll fire, and then they'll know where things are at. Um, and then somebody, of course, invented a, a, a watch that could keep track of time, a chronometer that could keep track of time while uh, they were at sea. Uh, the technology to keep track of time was not that great in those days. Um, and somebody came up with that. And this, this person was uh, John Harrison. He was actually a cabinet maker, not even a horologist, uh, but was able to, because he understood material science really well, came up with the mechanism that, that solved this problem. Um, why is it that we go to crowds? And wh what is the underlying problem that we're trying to solve when we go to crowds? Um, the first is about uncertainty. There's just tremendous uncertainty when it comes to innovation and R&D. Uh, Charles Kettering, uh, the technical co-founder of, of GM, in testimony to Congress basically said, when it comes to innovation, you don't know when you're going to get the thing, if it's going to have any value whatsoever. And, and really sort of emphasized the notion that, that when we engage in new directions, there's just uncertainty about the outcomes. Um, then we have a labor market problem, Joy's Law, uh, you might have heard of. Uh, so Bill Joy, you know, technical co-founder of Sun Microsystems, and in his experience in Silicon Valley, you know, he's coined this word, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. Uh, certainly at the Harvard Business School, when executives come, they don't want to hear this, but uh, you know, we, we try to get, get them this message. Um, finally, our models for organizing uh, creative effort are also changing as well. So a lot of you grew up with Britannica in your homes. Uh, how many of you have given Britannica to your kids? Two people, awful parents, the rest of us. Um, you know, our parents sacrificed all their money to get us Britannica, and none of us have. Well, what's happened in between? Well, in between there was Encarta, uh, if you remember that, uh, and that changed the distribution model, right? It went from door-to-door -door salespeople to Best Buy. Um, and then everybody's actually here at Wikipedia. Um, and Wikipedia, <laughs> You know, regardless of what you believe in Wikipedia or not, Wikipedia is amazing in two ways. One is on the web, it's on mobile, and so forth. But secondly, the production model is bottoms up. Anybody anywhere in the world can create an entry, participate in an entry, modify the entry, and so on. Um, and that has basically changed the way we think about the production of knowledge in this, in this dimension. Um, so what we're finding um, in looking at how crowds can get, get organized is that there's two distinct methodologies. One is through contests and competitions. Um, and this is used when the sponsor does not actually have a clue about who the right person might be or who the right, uh, what the right approach may be. So you have an open call, you get lots of people to participate and help you solve the problem. Um, and, or you can run an open source model, you can run a community-based model where you want lots of collaboration, lots of mixing and matching and co-production of knowledge as well. And both of these are, have, been, have been around for, for centuries, actually. So I showed you the example of, uh, of the, the Longitude Prize, but also communities have been around. Even uh, there's some now more recent work showing that the airplane was actually an open source invention until the Wright brothers came in and then shut off uh, uh, their, uh, the, th that, those communities because they went after patents. So very interesting examples of both of these existing in history. The underlying basic uh, feature is that we can find extreme values because we have lots of people participating. All right. So I want to just remind you back to Statistics 101 that you took in college. Right. Uh, in any kind of activity you do, there's an underlying distribution of outcomes. Typically, we'll say there's a normal distribution. And if you do it the first time by yourself, independently, you'll just get the average. Okay? And it's only by repeated independent attempts do you see the entire distribution. And what happens with crowds is that we basically get repeated independent attempts at solving the same problem, and we can find the extreme value. We can find the outlier very easily, often very cost-effectively, because we have all this parallel search going on. And this is what makes crowds work so well, of this ability for us to, to harness diversity and to have independent trials on the problem itself, allowing us to get these extreme value outcomes. So let me give you an example. I've been doing a bunch of work with NASA as well as our medical school. I'll give you a little bit of snapshot about both of those projects so you get a sense of what we've done. Um, here's a project we did for NASA recently. We ran this contest uh, back in April. Energy, in one form or another, powers everything on Earth and the man-made things floating above it too. 
This is the International Space Station. You've probably heard of it. It's powered by the sun, and the sun's energy is captured by the station's solar panels. Ensuring the space station harvests the most energy possible is a complicated task. Why? Well, for one reason, see those large solar panels? Holding them to the station are very long, thin arms called longerons. Anytime an odd number of longerons are in full sunlight, with others in the shadows cast by the rest of the space station, they bend, and eventually break. For this reason, ISS operators are careful to position the station to limit shadowing, and so only an even number of longerons are shadowed at one time. However, this conservative positioning reduces the power the station can collect from the sun, thus causing inefficiency. NASA wants more power for the ISS. More power means more science and cool stuff that NASA can do on orbit. NASA needs a sophisticated algorithm and they think you just might be the key to this whole equation. Introducing the NASA Tournament Labs International Space Station Longeron Challenge. Your solutions just may help power the International Space Station and allow more science from more scientists around the world. Consider this your invitation to blast off with NASA. For more information, visit topcoder.com slash ISS if you've got the right stuff. So we had a 30K uh, prize pool set up for a three-week contest. Um, we had about 500 competitors submit 2,000 code submissions uh, in that time period, uh, and winners from all over the world. Um, what's amazing, though, is the performance of the solution. So what I'm showing you here is the final solution performances in terms of watt hours. Um, this is the internal NASA solution. And this is where all of our guys showed up, okay? So in three weeks of time, we were able to meet, uh, and in some cases exceed, depending on how you me measure the, the solutions, what, what NASA had developed over many years, right? Um, and we were able to basically get the entire world to work on this problem and kick it uh, uh, you know, in, in very interesting ways. And also what's important for us is that we've discovered some new configurations that NASA didn't know was, was even possible. So as the space station ages, they can relieve some pressure on the, some, some of the joints based on the solutions that these guys have come up with. Um, so I'm gonna now quickly switch over to what we've done with the medical school uh, to again sort of think about how we bring crowds in directly so that we can actually solve medical problems. Um, if you think about the, the academic research process is, is highly vertically integrated. So a PI or research scientist comes up with a question, a hypothesis, uh, and then with their lab, they'll write a proposal. That proposal gets submitted to the NIH, right? And then their peers will evaluate them, and then they'll go out and run the, run the, run the experiment. Uh, so it's fairly vertically integrated. And we thought, is it possible for us to bring crowds in all on the process? Could we bring crowds in in just generating hypotheses? Could we bring crowds in in, in helping us evaluate the solutions? And could we actually change the, the ways in which teams actually form as well? And so we've done a whole lot of experiments in each of these phases. I'm just going to give you a perspective of the hypothesis generation perspective, because it, it, gives, you, it gives you some, um, actually, for me, it's very inspiring. Um, so again, we've done a range of work with the medical school. Um, and the, the issue around type 1 diabetes is that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a brutal disease. It affects young children. Um, and uh, the community wants new ideas. Uh, but oftentimes, the folks that do that new ideas are in the discipline itself of endocrinology, per se. Uh, and so Einstein's code here actually was inspiring to us to sort of say is, let's not worry about solutions, what we did before. Let's actually focus in on the problems themselves. Um, so we ran this contest on a platform called Innocentive. Uh, we ran a, uh, you know, ran a challenge for 25,000 bucks, again, six weeks. Uh, you know, lots of people participating, lots of great ideas. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with the details. What I want to end with you is one of the winners who um, uh, 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 came, uh, came out in the contest and what she said about the, about the process and her perspectives about it. Uh, thanks very much for having me here. It's also kind of unfortunate that my last name is Blewett, but, you know, you can't really do too much with that. Um, so she's a college So senior. I guess first I'll just talk about my proposal. So... Uh, I am a Harvard undergrad, I'm a senior, and I'm studying chemistry. And uh, I'm very interested in the chemistry underlying type 1 diabetes, specifically 
what is the role of the lipids in the pancreas in the, in the progression of type 1 diabetes. So preliminary data suggests that these lipids might in fact be autoantigens in type 1 diabetes. And I think that's worth following up on for several reasons. Uh, one of the first reasons is that these lipids are structurally very similar to a number of glycolipids displayed by bacteria. So you could imagine a scenario in which an infection followed by some sort of cross-reactivity in some cases might lead to an autoimmune condition. Uh, the second reason I think that uh, lipids should be investigated more thoroughly as autoantigens is that type 1 diabetes has been shown to co-occur with other autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis and also autoimmune thyroid condition. And sulfatid, which is a major lipid in the pancreas, is found primarily in, in three places in the body. The myelin sheath, which is the target of the autoimmune attack in multiple sclerosis, thyroid, which is obviously the target of the autoimmune attack in uh, autoimmune thyroid condition, and also in the pancreas. So it could be that if sulfatid is an autoantigen, that might shed some light on why these three diseases are co-occurring. Uh, as to why I entered the competition, I, I've been interested in lipid autoreactivity and type 1 diabetes for a while, for, for several years, but I didn't really have a forum for presenting the ideas to people and actually talking it through. Uh, as a college student, it's not, not always easy to, to go about doing that. Uh, and I also wanted to mention a quote that I heard last week from Brian Kernahan, who is a, a, one of the greats in computer science, and he was giving a talk uh, on the Cambridge side. And he said that in computer science today, the structural barriers to entry are very low. And it's, it's an economic term, but it's, it's really pretty interesting. And that's led to a lot of things like uh, a whole number of startups in recent years and also heightened innovation in the field. Uh, if you look at uh, fields of biology or chemistry today or medical research, I'd say the barriers to entry are very high. If you look at you know, the equipment in any of the labs around here, uh, that's you know, several BMWs often sitting on a bench. So it's, it's, it's quite a bit of financial resources that you need and also a huge human infrastructure in order to support that type of research. Uh, and the fantastic thing about this ideation challenge is that you're lowering the barriers to entry. So all you really need to get involved in a dialogue like this is uh, an idea and internet access. And I, I think that's quintessentially American. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today and uh, I look forward to talking with more of you afterwards. Thanks very much. So, you know, when I was a college senior, I was never this smart. <laughs> and, uh, and what's amazing is that what Megan put her uh, finger on is that the, the crowds lower the barrier for participation, right? There's lots of great ideas. And what we want to do and show is that we can decouple generating the ideas and solution generation and implementation. It doesn't have to be fully vertically integrated. And I think the opportunity in front of us is that there's a lot of passion amongst citizens to participate in climate change, to participate in preventing climate change or harnessing it for our best, uh, uh, best uses. And I think it's up to us, our institutions, and what Tom has done to basically say, how do we engage these citizens from around the world and how do we bring these new ideas inside? Because right now, I mean, I feel fairly comfortable to say that we can pretty much solve any technical problem that exists through using crowds. The, the barriers now are our institutions and our organizations to accept these solutions and make, make a go of them. Thanks. Well, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, and Tom, thank you for the opportunity to speak about uh, New York City and some of the areas that we're working on in sustainability and resilience, and, uh, and, and also to, to learn about the research you guys are doing uh, here, which is uh, fascinating. And uh, I, I want to say hi to Lou Carranza. Thanks for having me here, old friend and colleague from CIRA. And, uh, and Fred Krupp, who's a tremendous partner um, uh, for New York City. His organization's actually been instrumental in our key air quality initiatives, so I, I wanted to thank him as well. So um, the subject of this conference is incredibly timely for us, uh, in my view, as uh, distributed systems and new, new um, tools, uh, such as crowdsourcing, are becoming a, a more in integral part of our uh, programs. I think it's useful to frame the scale and nature of the challenge for us in New York City uh, as one of the older mega cities uh, in the world and also uh, a center of innovation in, in finance and real estate and energy. 
Um, so, you know, New York City's infrastructure in many ways is a marvel of engineering. Uh, it's home to the first electric utility in the world. And if you were to take all the copper under the ground and put it in one spot, it would be one of the largest copper mines uh, in the world. Uh, our water supply uh, is delivered by what is still the longest underground water tunnel, uh, underground tunnel in the world, uh, connecting more than 8 million people uh, to an upstate uh, watershed with pristine water, all powered by gravity, so it is a very low carbon footprint. Uh, the public transit system uh, allows us to have one of the lowest carbon footprints in North America. So this system, which has served us remarkably well, uh, has been the backbone of uh, the city's expansion and its economic growth and quality of life for many decades. But, but a key question, as Fred brought up earlier, is how to harness and shape uh, really the tremendous innovation that we're seeing uh, right now, not only in the energy sector, but also in distributed systems, and, and, to, and to, ha to handle some of the emerging challenges that we're facing. Um, as many of you know, in recent years we faced serious challenges uh, from extreme weather events, including historic peak load days um, uh, from heat waves over the past several summers, uh, Hurricane Irene several uh, years ago, and of course Superstorm Sandy last year. Uh, by mid-century, um, our panel of climate scientists we've assembled in New York City uh, expect uh, New York City to have as many 90-degree days as Birmingham, Alabama does today, and possibly up to three feet of sea level rise. And this will be a challenge not only to the reliability of our infrastructure, but also vulnerable communities. Um, and of course, the broader challenge is 50% of humanity lives in cities today. Uh, that's expected to increase to roughly 75% within the next 20 or 30 years. So this is a challenge, uh, really a global challenge, of dealing with dense urban environments. So I'd like to touch on three themes really quickly. Uh, first, the power of big data in our sustainability program, particularly in energy efficiency. Uh, second, innovations in remote sensing and telemetry that are part of our air quality initiatives. And, and finally, the role of um, public partition, participation in crowdsourcing, uh, for example, during Superstorm Sandy. Um, I'd like to start off by saying in 2007, you know, Mayor Bloomberg launched Plan YC, which was the city's comprehensive sustainability plan. Really, the goal is you know, to accommodate and expect a million more residents in New York City uh, over the next two decades while creating a more livable city uh, with the goal of having the cleanest air of any major city, uh, greater access to parks within a 10-minute walk of any resident, a million trees. Uh, a core piece of this plan has been to reduce our municipal greenhouse gas footprint by 30 percent by 2030. We're 16% percent um, in already. Uh, we've seen a 16% percent reduction, uh, and it's partly, as Fred mentioned, as a result of uh, switching away from uh, fuel oil and coal in the, in the regional sector, but also energy efficiency and renewables programs. Um, so it's been a tremendous experience working for the Bloomberg administration. Uh, what, what's the hallmark, I think, of our sustainability and resilience plan is really to be sharply focused on outcomes, transparency, the public interest, and most efficiently using data and scarce resources. We have about 30 researchers, you know, PhDs in electrical engineering, chemical engineering, uh, economists, attorneys who, uh, who, who, um, who, who work at this every day. So um, speaking first about big data, regarding energy efficiency. What's unique about New York City is 75% uh, of our carbon emissions actually originate from energy consumed in buildings, which is very different than cities, for example, in Los Angeles and Houston, where the transportation sector plays a much larger role. So understanding the very DNA of our building stock uh, is a key component to uh, really targeted and efficient uh, building sector policies. So we've actually assembled the largest database um, of any municipality uh, rough, all, all buildings over 50,000 square feet uh, now report their energy and water consumption. So we have currently a gold mine of data, roughly 2.5 billion square feet of real estate, which is more than San Francisco and Boston combined. Uh, so this information has a potential to transform the real estate market and, um, and what building owners and tenants, how they understand their energy use, which is often opaque. Uh, now the, now uh, consumers can more accurately factor in the costs associated with energy consumption in their, in their transactions decisions. So we, we see this as a, a really a transformative uh, a data uh, uh, driven, driven policy. Um, another area looking at remote sensing and telemetry for our air quality program, and, and the punchline here being that the mayor just announced uh, several weeks ago that New York City today has the cleanest air that it's had in 50 years. And that's partly a result of, of some of these programs. So really, the original sustainability plan called for a neighborhood-based air monitoring system. At the time, we had only maybe 10 air monitoring stations in the city. But by 2008, our Department of Health figured out a way to have a, a briefcase-sized module. And now we have you know, more than 100 monitoring sites around, around the city. And what that enabled us to do was to figure out that there's actually a correlation between local particulate matter emissions concentrations 
and, and boilers that burn heavy fuel oil. And seeing that correlation really triggered a set of policies. We've been working closely with the Environmental Defense Fund. And it's partly regulatory, it's partly financing, it's partly working with the utilities. But we, um, you know, over the past five years, the, um, uh, I think the, the great news is we've seen wintertime sulfur dioxide levels drop by almost 70%. Nickel by 35 percent, uh, particulate matter by almost a quarter, and what the econometricians tell us that that's, that roughly is equivalent to uh, preventing nearly 2,000 hospitalizations and ER visits from cardiovascular disease. So this is really, if you look at the power of data, and so New York City's gone from being, uh, I believe, in, in ninth place as far as air quality of major cities to fourth place over those five to seven years, I think largely a result of a really concerted effort to understand where those emissions were coming from. Um, if you look at electric vehicles, for example, we um, are enabling really public participation to, to shape where infrastructure is going to be built. You know, as, as you all know, one of the key challenges in developing EV infrastructure is understanding how demand patterns uh, will evolve in order to make uh, efficient capital investment decisions. So um, New York collaborated with Boston and Philadelphia to create missionelectric.org, a map-based social tool that allows New Yorkers to have a voice in electric vehicle infrastructure, essentially voting for uh, where they would like to place that infrastructure. And, um, We've engaged, for example, the drugstore chain, uh, Dwayne Reed, uh, on this, and Hertz and others. So that's, that's uh, you know, I think a, a tremendous uh, tool. Now, uh, concluding with Sandy for a moment, as you all know, on October 29th of last year, Superstorm Sandy made landfall just south of New York City, um, which really, you know, if you look at a 14-foot storm surge, really devastated the coastline. Almost a quarter of the city lost power. It's around 800,000. Uh, customers, which is a couple million people, um, 80,000 people lost, uh, customers lost natural gas service, the steam system essentially was shut down, uh, 40, 44 people uh, died, six hospitals were evacuated, uh, the regional refined products infrastructure was severely damaged, and the local supply chain of gasoline essentially collapsed with, uh, at its worst point, only 16% of gas stations able to dispense um, uh, and deliver gasoline. So the restoration of the power sector at the utility scale was accomplished within several weeks, but the unique challenge was the extensive amount of flooding meant that uh, buildings were also flooded, basements were flooded, switchgear and boilers were damaged, and a utility can't recharge, re-energize those units until you actually have a certified electrician come in and fix that. So, you know, the, the situational awareness uh, component became incredibly important, trying to understand what, which, which communities were impacted. Um, and, and the city mobilized, uh, you know, a fleet of electricians and plumbers to go and uh, as part of the rapid uh, repairs program to go and fix, um, fix those units so, so, so uh, residents could be, could be hooked back in as quickly as possible. And you look at the unprecedented need to integrate data between governments and utilities, uh, was an evidence there. So really, from, from our perspective, it's really a heroic effort by first responders, fire, police, National Guard, utility workers. Um, our, our little research team was also embedded in the emergency operations. And, and one of the areas, for example, where I think crowdsourcing is of interest, if you look at as I mentioned, the refined products infrastructure um, uh, suffered severe damage, and uh, you, you, there were long gas stations, long lines around gas stations, and and, and uh, we were really scraping the bottom of a gasoline supply. And it ended up that you know we were doing you know more than 100 interviews with gas stations, confirming it with with uh, NYPD patrols. Uh, the data that we were getting from uh, other you know federal agencies was uh, you know not exactly reflective of what was happening on the ground. So. It ended up that a crowdsourcing tool called Gas Buddy was very helpful. Uh, it basically helped us understand what was going on on the ground and gave us situational awareness to actually help craft uh, uh, a response to understand exactly what was going on. Um, it, that was only one piece of it, but I think there was an interesting insight from that, from that situation. So <clears throat> after the storm, the mayor pulled together the agencies and um, asked really three questions. One is, you know, wh what actually happened during the storm? What could happen in the future? And how do, how do we address that um, uh, for, um, uh, going forward? And our special initiative really resulted in 257 initiatives, a $19 billion plan looking at coastal measures, critical infrastructure, including utilities, hospitals, food, buildings. And, you know, a couple key, key uh, insights. The first is, you know, don't fight the last war. Every extreme weather event's gonna be different. The timing of the tidal patterns, if you know, we did some simulations that showed that if the storm had come six to eight hours earlier, 
it would have affected a very different part of the city than it did. Um, another element is uh, we, we, we're a coastal city, 530 miles of coastline. Uh, you can't harden everything. Um, although we have a $3 billion coastal plan, uh, you want a layered response. You want a coastal plan which has creative uh, ways of looking at uh, nourishing beaches, building bulkheads, but you also want to look at your critical utility infrastructure, you want to look at buildings, you want to look at hospitals. Um, if you look at by mid-century, as I mentioned, um, the, with the expected sea level rise on the outer envelope, roughly the 90% confidence interval, you're going to have roughly two-thirds of the city's electric utility infrastructure, the critical infrastructure, is going to be in the new 100-year floodplain. So that's a, that's a major challenge. And so we're in the process right now with our Public Service Commission of what, which, what I think is an unprecedented review of the entire utility infrastructure, looking at the costs and benefits of hardening, uh, looking at distributed resources, looking at um, how to improve situational awareness, uh, where can we look at innovative ideas such as building microgrids around critical infrastructure like hospitals and high-rise buildings and telecom switching hubs, um, and, and really looking at how to jumpstart the innovation in, in, a, a, uh, in the power sector uh, at the same time, the city is looking at really creating a living laboratory concept uh, on its own municipal footprint. Um, we have, um, under the mayor's leadership, we've attracted uh, you know, several new campuses, the NYU, uh, sorry, the Cornell Technion campus and the NYU um, uh, CUSP Center. Um, the investments that we're making, we have roughly an $800 million energy budget for municipal government. Roughly 10% of that, $80 million, goes to innovative projects from uh, everything from retrofitting municipal buildings to looking at integrating uh, different solar concepts, um, looking at wastewater treatment plants, harnessing digester gas in, in, in creative ways. So, you know, in conclusion, I think, um, you know, this conference to me is fascinating. I think we've only scratched the surface of the capabilities of, of uh, uh, distributed systems and, 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 uh, uh, and, and crowdsourcing. And I think, um, and, and this is not just an issue obviously for us in New York City, but globally. So uh, I'm really interested to hear uh, what, what, uh, what the rest of the conference is gonna, is gonna yield. Thanks very much. Okay, so thank you both for really fascinating uh, descriptions of the things you're doing. Uh, let me start by just asking if either of you have questions for the others, and then I have some questions, and then we'll move to the audience to let their questions. When are you going to come down to New York City? <laughs> so, soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, if, no, if neither of you has a burning question for the other, let, let me ask each of you to try to make the link with what you, between what you said and what the other said. So for instance, from Kareem's point of view, um, uh, you heard Sergey talk about some of their problems, some of the things they've been doing about them. Did any ideas occur to you about ways that crowds or other things you've studied might be applied to their problems in ways they haven't done yet? Or from Sergey's point of view, um, are there things you'd like help with that you think crowds might be able to help with that Kareem might have some ideas about? You know, one thing that immediately hit me as you discussed the air quality, mon the monitoring, environmental mo monitoring equipment you guys have laid out, you've now 100, 100 systems out there, uh, that that's, that's eminently hackable, right? You can actually go for trying to make it lower cost, open hardware, and get lots of people engaged in lowering the cost for these things so that it shouldn't just be the city putting these out there, but in fact, any citizen that wants it on their rooftop could in fact create, you know, either purchase it themselves or build it themselves and have, you know, a very distributed, even localized monitoring of, of air quality and so forth yeah. coming through. Yeah, that's actually very interesting and I'd love to talk to you about it because as you, as the air gets cleaner, the, uh, the more challenging elements become uh, uh, pockets, sometimes within buildings or urban heat islands. And so getting that grid to be denser and uh, looking at it, that's, we're starting to look at that. So. Uh, that, that, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, because I, th I think both from a technology point of view in terms of people engaging and trying to solve this problem, yeah. uh, but also I think from a, um, in, uh, from a citizen action perspective, that they, would, that they can now be the local monitor in their mm -hmm. own neighborhood, in their own little zip code, or even their own sub-sub-zip code, uh, and then having an infrastructure that actually takes that data and represents it back to mm -hmm. the citizens, I think, is, is you know, eminently like a yeah. clear thing you can apply. Yeah, right that's away. a great idea. So, Sergey, do you have any other big problems, either that you talked about or that you haven't talked about, that you'd like? <coughs> well, I, I listened to some problems? of them. I mean, I think, um, 
you know, so air, air quality is one of them. Uh, the electric vehicle, like picking actually charger networks, we've only really started to do that. I think it's very interesting. People are very engaged. Uh, you get a lot of hits on the website. Uh, people are very passionate about, you know, their neighborhood being picked and so forth. Um, I think. Um, the, the one of the one of the challenges right now because it's a it's a big maybe big capital investment problem and maybe there's a cheaper way to do that is uh, uh, better situational awareness during storms and if you look at um, whether you want to call it a smart grid and smart metering or some other way to uh, enable that intelligence to roll up to the utilities uh, in a, in a, more quickly so the long tail in restorations that we saw gets tightened a little bit. Um, so, you know, one option is to have a very capital intensive uh, uh, type of outlay. It, uh, there are probably more interesting solutions. We actually have a, a $40 million uh, competition with community development block grants to look at uh, innovation on uh, in distributed systems, essentially. But, uh, um, you know, I'd love to hear, and we, you should come down to New York City, we'll walk you through uh, uh, some of the details. But uh, um, I think there, there's a tremendous uh, opportunity for innovation here, so, yeah. But yeah, and I, I, think, I think, again, what I would sort of think there is that there's a, there's a, you almost need like a problem generation process where you just sort of ask the citizens in New York City to say like, what are the types of problems that we need to be solving in these types of issues? And just, they don't need the ability to solve it, they just need the ability to raise the questions. And that in itself and the input back from the citizens about what are the important problems can help guide your, your investment strategy. So it can become fairly recursive. I mean, if you look at, you know, if you think about Kickstarter, what's amazing about Kickstarter beyond just the crowdfunding is that in fact, anybody anywhere that has an idea can actually raise that as a hypothesis and then get feedback from the crowd about the viability of that idea. Um, and the fact that we've seen such tremendous degrees of, of innovation, especially in hardware, tells you that there's a lot of latent uh, energy and, and demand for it. We just need an infrastructure that can absorb those ideas, deal with them, mm -hmm. and then find ways to credibly put them out there again. Another thing I was thinking as I was listening to you, Sergey, most of the examples you talked about were fairly operational, like situational awareness about what's happening after the floods and so forth. Uh, you mentioned at least one example of the electric vehicle charging, which is a little more longer term planning. Um, but I wondered if you had thoughts or questions about uh, longer term issues, not just the operational or tactical, but the more strategic questions about longer term plans and whether crowds could be involved in those in some way. Yeah, so I think we've, um, we, we've started the last couple of years really trying to harness um, the, the um, really the creativity and, 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 and thoughts on, um, you know, behavioral research, you know, what, what, uh, what are the areas of, of great interest to, uh, uh, to the resident, to residents as far as, uh, you know, ranking, you know, rank order of, of uh, key sustainability policies. So we have, we have a tremendous amount of information that, that, that's, that's come in. Um, I think, you know, if you look at long-term resilience plans, um, you know, we have, it was a $19 billion event roughly, uh, and uh, depending on how much, uh, you know, um, if, if the city is underfunded ultimately uh, by um, some of the, the federal uh, storm-related money, one of the questions is how, what, are, what are the creative solutions, community-based solutions uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to address the long-term resilience issue if, in fact, some of the big capital investments uh, are not budgeted for? Um, and that's, that's a, a, you know, that's a generational <laughs> uh, uh, question as well. Um, so that's one thought. Yeah. So. so, okay, so now let me ask you to each broaden your scope a little bit. Uh, you talked about a particular set of crowd examples, and Sergey, you talked about uh, applications or issues about climate in the case of a, of a city, a major metropolitan area. Uh, since this is the opening panel for the whole conference, let me ask if each of you have any thoughts about how, how these things might apply more broadly. For instance, Sergey, I know you have some experience in the private sector as well as in the public sector. Um, the, the problems that a city faces are in some ways unique to a, being a city, but I think in other ways they may have implications for what larger scale of governments like national governments or what businesses or other kinds of organizations might be, uh, might be facing, and I'd be interested in any thoughts you have about that. Similarly for Kareem, uh, uh, you talked about several specific examples of crowds. Uh, are there other examples of things like Folded or other kinds of crowd examples or other applications to businesses and other kinds of organizations? So I'll let each of you answer that if you'd like. Do you want to take that first? Sure. Um, 
So, I mean, I think, you know, over the last decade, we've just seen an explosion of experimentation in the broader society and the economy around crowds. So, you know, if you sort of think about open source as one example, which really started in the, in the late 70s uh, and has gone to the point now where, you know, all the people using Android are using open source software. Lots of our critical infrastructure, both at the high end and the low end, is running open source. It's quite remarkable how software development and uh, and, and even software entrepreneurship has changed because of crowds working away on their own very quietly, creating all the software. Um, and I think uh, similarly with the contest uh, regime as well, we've seen this explosion in, this, in these approaches. And we've seen now examples from you know, man manufacturing cars, designing cars, to so solving you know, uh, uh, protein uh, chemistry problems. And I think, I think, I think the, for me and my work with NASA now is actually, I'm, I'm sort of tired of creating proofs of concepts. Like we know this works, we know this works really well. And the question now is how do we change our organizations so that they can use this resource uh, routinely and that there isn't a tremendous degree of resistance inside the organizations towards this perspective. There are now, what's amazing is that, that now any, any of you can with a credit card you know, get a crowd of 1,000 people working on your problem. I mean, that degree of, of flexibility in sort of ideation and resources, it was just never available. You needed to be like the British Parliament before to run a contest, and now you can, with a, with a, with a credit card, run your own contest and get feedback on, on various things. So, I, you know, for me, the, the and, and what's amazing is that, again, we just see so many, you know, variety from, again, from engineering to science, to, to add production. We, we see crowds engage routinely and routinely outperforming internal solutions. And I think, I think the challenge for us at large institutions and companies and nonprofits is, uh, and governments is to really say, you know, how do we change our processes so we can, we can tap into the crowd routinely and have the expertise to be able to ask the questions, be able to assess the answers, and then um, uh, bring the solutions online. That's a great point, that this is sort of, we've proved that it works far more applicable. Yes. What's stopping us from using it a yes, lot more? Absolutely. Great point. Sergey, what well, do you think? I want to speak more broadly about data in, in municipalities. As I mentioned, you know, 75% of the world's population is going to be in cities um, in, in a couple of decades. And I think uh, one thing we've tried to do in the mayor in New York City is really uh, use that tremendous amount of data uh, coming, coming from, from residents, ultimately, whether it's you know, uh, consumption and, and of energy uh, to, to, to other ideas, and really, um, really have a data-driven, um, really transparent um, uh, policy construct. And in many cases, as, as I mentioned, uh, you, you, you might, unless you had actually done the, uh, the data analysis, uh, you wouldn't have known to apply certain policies. And I think we've only really scratched the surface. And crowdsourcing is one, one big piece of it. But um, if you look at some of the emerging cities around the world, uh, these tools uh, are going to be critical, uh, particularly if you don't have a, uh, not only a national, but an international regime on, on, on uh, uh, climate change. Um, these these things ultimately we, we find that they're in, in many cases in the interest of, of residents that there is a, a payback period that makes sense that there is um, and you don't know it until you actually dig through the data uh, do the data mining do the analysis y you find that there's actually a value proposition in many cases um, that that if you really tailor your policies based on that data uh, that, that, that can make sense so great so you're highlighting the value not just of crowds solving problems, but of big data yeah. gathered from crowds that can be used to solve problems with or without the crowds sure. in, in the actual solving process. OK, great examples. Now I think let's turn to the audience and see what questions you have. Please come forward to the microphone and ask your questions from there. Do you want to start? Actually, you may have already answered my question just now, which was uh, you mentioned the Gas Buddy, uh, you know, using a pre-existing community, and uh, you know, Kareem, I wondered if um, you had done work on looking. You know, you talked about competition and community. Uh, and I wondered about repurposing communities, whether you look into that sort of thing. I haven't particularly looked at that in, 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 from, my, from my research point of view, but I think it's a great idea that, in fact, there's these pockets of communities out there already doing, you know, like, like reporting gas prices and, and, and finding ways, creative ways for us to, again, get our institutions to be aware of them and find ways to repurpose them or at least take their data and then apply them to, like, a, 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 an emergency planning situation that you faced as well. Absolutely. And what's amazing is that there's, you know, again, as soon as you scratch the surface, there's tons of them around. 
Um, and it's, it's up to us again and our creativity to see how we could actually do the repurposing. Okay, great. Okay, this question is for Kareem. Um, I'm a blogger and a maker. And you talked about uh, top down, breaking down existing structures to make crowds more friendly. But I want to flip it. How do you take a crowd of people that say meet online through any number of platforms and they go from crowd to community to organization? Are there steps along to push that process along? And what happens as you move along that continuum? So Tom and I are accepting PhD applications on this question directly. Uh, I mean, that's, <laughs> a, a, that's, a, that's a, it's a, it's a fundamental question you've asked. Because I mean, I think what we have are, are really good examples, but there's no general theory yet in terms of the steps that, that allows for sort of crowds to sort of organize and then from there create, you know, the, the great things that we see in open source or the open hardware movement and so on. I think, I think we're, we're, we're getting hints about it, but it's, you know, really early days in, in terms of, you know, so when I look at a Mozilla Foundation, when I look at Linux, I mean, they're, they're sort of the early day Edisons of this new ways of organizing ourselves. Uh, but I don't think there is, at least I wouldn't, I don't think I can tell you, I don't know if, if Tom can, if there's a, there's a theory behind it yet that we can actually, you know, I mean, I think the, the practice is, is far out of theory. I mean, trying to understand what the, the regularities are. Uh, certainly, you know, things like a common cause, you know, uh, ways in which you can separate the work and distribute the work amongst many people, all those bit build into it, but I don't think there's a, at least for myself, there's a grand theory, unifying theory for it. So I, I actually think the way you asked the question was how do we move from crowds to communities to organizations on the kind of implicit assumption that we need to do that in order to accomplish our goals. Uh, it seems to me that many of the th examples that Kareem talked about, for instance, say Wikipedia or the Linux open source operating system, the community that built that, those are things that you could certainly call crowds, but in the classes I teach for MBAs, I also call them organizations. I mean, uh, Wikipedia is certainly accomplishing the goals that the Encyclopedia Britannica organization used to accomplish. Linux community is certainly accomplishing the goals that Microsoft or IBM or other organizations like that might have done. So I think in some cases, all we need to do to make the transition is change the name, because they're already doing what organizations do. OK, thank you. OK. I think it takes more than changing the name. Well, but. yeah, that, that's maybe a simplistic way of saying it, but it's, it's a different perspective. That is, if we choose to view them as performing the functions of organizations, then we see that they actually are. I, uh, I have a question for, for Mr. Minofsky. Um, when, you, when you're harnessing crowds, so to speak, in New York City, so trying to get people engaged um, who might normally not really care about sustainability or energy efficiency, what, what strategies have you found to be successful? Um, there's a lot of people in New York, a lot of people who probably don't care uh, very much at all, if anything, about energy efficiency or really climate change. So how do you get them engaged, and, and what have you found to be effective? Thank you. Yeah, very good question. I think in the case of New York City, actually, people are pretty passionate about the topic. So um, I, I think we have a pretty engaged, um, uh, we have very engaged communities. So, so you know, we, we do have a, a community affairs unit and also part of our team. Uh, we, we do spend a lot of time with um, the community boards, which is like uh, kind of a neighborhood-based uh, uh, um, uh, you know, organization, organizations, and there's you know, dozens and dozens throughout the city. So we, we spend a lot of time face-to-face. Uh, also, and, and, as, and as I mentioned, we also have um, you know web-based tools we use as well. But we found that people are um, very engaged, particularly around uh, community-based uh, community-based issues. Okay. Mark Ottensmeyer, good to see Hello. you, Kareem. Uh, as a former classmate, I'd debate your point on not being that smart when you were an undergrad. Um, question about contests. Um, I sort of look at it as an outsider. I haven't participated in these things, but I'm wondering about the economics of it. It seems to me that you've got a bunch of people saying, okay, I'm going to give $30,000 to a, like one of a few bunch of people, and there's a whole lot more who are devoting a lot of sweat equity, time, taking stuff away from the job that they're supposed to be doing, and I'm wondering how the economics of that works out. Is it sort of a niche thing, or uh, and should stay that way, or do you want to see this spread out a lot farther? Of course, I'm all about crowds, you know, 
taking over the world. But um, no, I think the economics are very interesting. I mean, I think what you see, and we've done a bunch of work on this to understand the motivations, why are people participating? And we see heterogeneous motivations. So some people are in it for the money and want to want to participate for that. Some people just want to enjoy the problem solving. You know, oftentimes I'm running my field experiments on top of these platforms where I'm changing incentives, I'm changing information, I'm causing people to team. And these are very smart people, and they, they send me hate mail, right? They go, we hate you, we hate you. Like, why are you messing around with our activities? But then they also say, PS, don't stop us sending us these important problems. Um, so I think, I think in many cases, and this is the story of Linux, is that Linux got built on the backs of board systems administrators mm -hmm. because they, they were like, I can do much more than just run a computer network. I actually have some jobs, and I can contribute to that. So I think, I think the enjoyment of the activity matters a lot, the sense of accomplishment that these things provide them, mm -hmm. and even knowing where they are in the rank order, even if they not win, but if they're number 10 out of 500, mm -hmm. that actually matters a lot. And so what we're finding is that in many cases, um, that the economics are both sort of these explicit motives of, of cash, but a ton of implicit motives that, you know, uh, that, that we as uh, social scientists are just now sort of scratching the surface on and trying to see how they actually fit into what at the surface looks like a very sort of Darwinistic process, like we're gonna have a winner take all process and prizes to the top guys. Um, but you know, uh, amazing for me in looking at many of these contest settings is that there's a big community substrate and people participate for these identity issues, for the fun and enjoyment issues as well. And right. often, many companies don't provide those for their employees. Hmm. I actually have two questions, um, if I may. Uh, if we don't have time, that's fine. Um, the, with regard to uh, using data that's available in the city, the cell phones, the smartphones today, have an enormous amount of power. Can measure temperature, can measure pressure, it actually has a radiation sensor. Um, so if you, if you, and they're probably gonna start putting in things so you can measure CO2 and that kind of thing. So if you could crowdsource, crowdsource that information, you'd have sensors basically everywhere and you have GPS that you could send. So people may be willing to provide that kind of information as far as emergency planning. I'm just gonna use the radiation sensor since I'm a nuclear engineer. Um, if everybody had a radiation sensor on their, phone and then there was an emergency in the city or something like that, if you could publish um, information that would request that information to, by GPS to try to f find, you know, what the spread of the radiation is in the city. If you could do similar things for a uh, gas release and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of things. I heard that um, Switzerland's putting fiber optic cables and Wi-Fi in their roads and the cars are all getting computers in them and everybody has smartphones. So you could essentially do grid information and, and essentially eliminate all collisions in the city and that sort of thing. Uh, and I was wondering if that's the kind of thing that you were thinking about when you were talking about crowdsourcing types of information. Well, I'm so glad I'm at this conference. These are all great ideas. And so I can't speak on behalf of every agency. We have an Office of Emergency Management and Department of Transportation. They're, they are using some of these types of tools. Um, and our, our teams really are sus the sustainability, energy, environment, res resilience team. And I think these are, these are great ideas. I would love to, um, you know, talk to you guys about how to, how to harness this, what, you know, what's the right kind of platform to do it. We do some of it. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, on, on uh, getting some situational awareness, what happened with gas stations, getting public opinion on things. But um, as, 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 as the suite of sensing uh, uh, technologies improves on, on the smartphones, I mean, that could, that, that's actually a really interesting. Now, I don't know if you can, uh, it's probably going to take some time until you get, uh, uh, you know, the ability to, to, to measure different, you know, types of molecules and things like that. Uh, uh, but maybe we're just a couple years away from that. Or you're saying it, we it, have that already? It, it will take time to get them into the cell phones, but they've already been developed. No, no, understood. There's something cost effective that everyone could use. But, but yeah, no, this, I would love to. Uh, chat with you some more on that. So, okay. and if I may add, I mean, NSC might already have this data, but <laughs> beyond those kinds of jokes, um, I, th I think what's also important to note is that, that you don't need everybody with that with that capability. You just need a small critical mass, and that could be 100,000 people distributed across the city could actually. So, so oftentimes we think, well, everybody, in the, all 8 million people have need that need that technology, but in fact, it could be a very small critical mass. Oh, no, that's right. That's that right. could be you, that could that could be distributed. You can even you do use the the sound sensors and the GPS location to find people in collapsed buildings or something yeah. like that. If you had something you could just turn off 
on yeah. the receipt of that information if you were in the local area. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole, I think there's a whole opportunity to sort of build apps for urban environments, right? right? Yeah, right. You know, that, that, you that could be right. where, where you can say that, you know, there's so many issues where data yeah. is important for yeah. the urban, yeah. urban governance, and then, you know, we can have data come through these apps um, that can come through. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the second question, a lot shorter. Have you heard of the Fisonic um, Corporation? It's actually operating out of New York City. It is building heating, replacing heating systems in New York City apartment complexes such that they can pump the, uh, the heat through the house, or excuse me, through the apartment complexes with no electrical power uh, and no moving devices. And they're backfitting this into the Con Ed um, feed pumps so that they can produce the heat, the steam, to heat these complexes. And they reduce energy consumption by 35%. Water purchases by 50% and sewage discharges by 50%. Yeah. No, I, I've heard of them. I know they're doing a pilot with Con Ed, so I'm eager to yeah. see the, the latest results on that. I know they're doing innovation on the, the STEAM system, so thank, thank you. you. Great. So within the paradigm of crowd solutions and gathering data from crowds and crowd innovation, how do we ensure that social justice is met, equality, and 100% sustainability? Is it that crowds are just kind of showing up with solutions and we're playing with them? Or is there a system in which crowd solutions can come up that fit into a larger context? I'll let you two answer. <laughs> <laughs> just That's just wondering. Um, I think I, oftentimes I think it does depend upon the types of questions you're, you're asking the crowd, um, but also the, the parameters for engagement. Uh, and a, a key component that we've sort of seen is that there's a tremendous degree of self-selection. You can't put, you can't force somebody to participate in, in a crowdsourcing effort or a community effort. It's, it's, it's really, the self-selection effect is very strong. And I think self-selection is, is based on a bunch of things, and I think part of it can also be sort of the, the ethos that the sponsoring organization is, 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 is broadcasting to the rest of the world. And I think that, I think, is, is, a, is, a, is a big component as well. So I think as you, as you start engaging the crowd, you want to think about what is attracting them to me, and are, is my ethos as much as important, and am I broadcasting that as a signal for self-selection as anything else as well? So it's, it's a, bit, a bit of a meta answer. I don't, again, I don't have a concrete way to, to answer that question for you, but for me, I see the self-selection effect as being the strongest effect. And I think technically that's, uh, the, the, that is correct. Part, but on the political side, probably it's, uh, uh, you know, we're in a democracy and it really depends on the leadership. Uh, and, and in many places, uh, in the case of New York City, you have a lot of local areas of, uh, you, know, you have community boards, you have boroughs, you have, you know, mayor and the city council, you have a lot of layers of, of, of democracy and work. And I, I think that that process, uh, uh, you know, is, is I think it works, um, but every city's different, every location's different, so it's, it's going to depend on uh, the you know the, the institutional framework in which you're applying the technologies. So. I guess I would say one thing, which is even though having crowds involved certainly doesn't guarantee social justice, I think it's a useful step in that direction. Just the transparency, the visibility, and the voice that you have when crowds are involved is more more likely to lead you in the direction you'd want to go. Could you say that also for sustainability? Because I think some of the issues of sustainability, crowds don't necessarily, aren't necessarily um, informed on, like p carbon tax. If you ask people in the crowd, you know, in information system now, they would probably say, oh, it's a terrible thing. So could you, could you say that well, to, can you address sustainability Of course, it depends well? on the crowds and the issues. Uh, I think you're right that uh, many crowds today aren't very well informed or even necessarily very sort of kind of uh, oriented towards sustainability issues. To the degree you crowdsource things like that, you won't necessarily get more sustainability. Uh, but to the degree crowds become more committed to those issues, more concerned about those issues, then crowdsourcing leads you to more, uh, more focus and more support for that. In fact, one of our hopes with uh, the Climate Collab project is that even if we didn't get any better ideas coming out of the crowds, by having the crowds engaged in thinking about the problems, we're likely to increase support for whatever the solutions are. Right. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to see that there have been a number of questions on the difference between uh, contests and community and the, and the community development of, of, of crowdsourcing. That aspect, I think, is really important. Um, there's also another level of community. 
Uh, Christiana Figuera is the uh, UN chief of the, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, was at Harvard a couple of weeks ago, and she was talking about the good news about climate change, and the good news about climate change, according to her, was that there are many cities and municipalities around the world who are actually doing things in contradistinction to governments and international agreements. So I'm wondering if New York, for instance, is partnering with other cities, looking at crowdsourcing through cities, municipalities around the world, over 300 doing stuff, for solutions. And also, at NYU, Natalie Jaramajenko, who I hope you're working with in terms of monitoring, and uh, Clay Shirky in terms of crowdfunding are resources that you can look at in your own city. I can ask you to answer in a minute or less. Well, I'll just say that, um, so, so Mayor Bloomberg is a chair of C40, which is a, a uh, essentially a, a consortium of cities looking at innovation and sustainability and resilience. So right now there's a, I think, a very strong network of, uh, you know, all, all the major cities in the world who are who's sustainability managers are talking to each other, who are looking at best practices, you know, crowdsourcing being one of them, but uh, looking across the board from ener energy to waste to transportation. So, and that's really emerged really over the last, you know, five or six years that they're really talking to each other. So I think, um, so I think at that level, that, that discussion is, is, is happening. Okay, great. I'm afraid we don't have time for the last two questions, or last two questioners. They won't actually be questions, I guess. Yeah. But I, I wanna thank our, our panelists for a fascinating conversation about some really interesting and important topics. Thank you. Thank you.